Welcome to everyone here. Uh, tonight, so is the first lecture of our spring series, which revolves around uh, the main conceptual tool of the NCCR on the move, that is the Migration Mobility Nexus. And in our conception, the Migration Mobility Nexus works like a, as a lens that enables to explore how and why uh, migration and mobility are bound together. In this series, our keynote speakers will address four possible interplays between migration and mobility. Enablement tonight with uh, Jill Ahrens. Continuum um, with Angela Paparusso on the 25th of March. Hierarchy on the 6th of May with Saskia Bonjour and Sarah Kunz and opposition on 27th of May with Nicholas de Genova. So tonight we have the pleasure to welcome Jill Ahrens, who is a research associate at the Sussex Center for Migration Research. She has conducted extensive research on uh, international students' mobility, on migrations between Africa and Europe, and also on intra-EU mobility of Nigerian migrants. And with her research background, I think she makes the perfect candidate to explore some ways in which migration enables mobility and the other way around. And I'm grateful that Judith Kende and uh, Mathieu Vetois, our postdoctoral and doctoral fellows at the NCCR on the move, have invited her. So tonight she will present results from one study on Nigerian onward migration trajectories in Europe and another research on students at international branch campuses in Dubai to show how onward migration and transnationalism are interconnected. She will be speaking for about 45 minutes. And then Laure Sando, our postdoc at the NCCR on the move, will have about 10 minutes to discuss her presentation. And afterwards, we will open the discussion to the audience on WebEx here and also on YouTube until 7.45. So, Jill, your talk is entitled Onward Migration and Multi-Sited Transnationalism. What are the interconnections? And I very much look forward to it. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Robert, um, for the introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak um, as part of the NCCR Spring um, series um, of public lectures. Um, yeah, it's a real shame that I can't uh, be there with you um, in person. But um, yeah, this on online alternative um, is 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 great. And uh, thank you for preparing everything uh, for this event. Um, uh, yes, and I also look forward to um, see you tomorrow for tomorrow morning's workshop and um, to yeah engage in further discussions. Um, the um, selected theme for the um, spring series, as uh, Robin mentioned, is the migration and mobility nexus. And um, the researchers at the NCCR have been engaging with the migration mobility nexus as an analytical tool that allows us to reflect and conceptualize different types of connections between migration and mobility. And um, uh, I will, um, yeah, I was invited to speak um, on one particular connection between migration and mobility, the concept of an aim of Um And yeah, this then um, translates into the questions, um, how does um, mobility uh, enable migration and vice versa? Um, although I did find myself straying also um, into the other, um, yeah, um, types of connections a little bit, um, as you will see. Um, before I delve into the migration mobility nexus, I wanted to take a step back and offer a broader framing of migration and transnational mobilities based on the research that I have been conducting today. Um, I'm going to talk about onward migration, especially over the last few years, there's been a real flurry um, of publications on onward migration. And I was happy to see two special issues being published um, on multinational migration, guest edited by Andrew Paul and Brenda Yeo. They're kind of fresh off the press now. 
Um, the topic of today's talk actually also is the focus of a book that I'm currently co-editing together with Russell King. Um, this edited volume contains chapters from a range of authors who presented and discussed their research about onward migration at two panels we organized at last year's AMISCO online conference. Um, the particular objective was for us to critically evaluate um, the research methods we employ and the conceptual and analytical frameworks we use in the study of onward migration. Um, we propose to uh, yeah, use um, transnationalism and um, this edited book will be um, prefaced um, by an introduction written by Russell and me and therefore any comments and feedback are very welcome at this stage. Um, the book it's planned for publication um, later this summer as part of the AMISCO research series and all chapters will be available open access in case you're interested. <clears throat> okay, um, to start off, um, let me just uh, make sure that I can change the slides. Uh -uh, da, 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 da. I'm just stuck on this slide at the moment for some reason. Um, that's a little bit unusual. Um, just let me see if I can fix this. I don't have here any possibility at the moment to move to the next slide? Maybe here. Okay, it's on the side. Um, so the um, onward migration um, is part of um, yeah two possible um, moves um, um, that are usually yeah framed under remigration, quite confusingly um, as a term. Um, so um, remigrants are those migrants who leave destination countries and um, they either return or they onward migrate. Um, it is important to embed onward migration within broader processes. Um, we know that global, the global map of migration has continuously been evolving. However, several key events over the last two decades, such as the 2008 financial crisis and the so-called refugee crisis in 2015 and 16, and now also the corona pandemic have fundamentally reconfigured previous human mobility patterns. So, um, in addition, um, we will likely feel the impacts of, of other enduring challenges that will further diversify and fragment global mobility and migration processes, um, such as the worrying spread of xenophobic and uh, racist attitudes over recent years. Um, we have witnessed um, how nationalism and nativist ideas gain ground and right-wing populism has won more electoral support in Hungary, in Italy, in Brexit era, UK, um, and Bolsonaro's Brazil, and also in Trump's USA, but also in many other countries. The demonization of immigrants has led to travel restrictions for certain ethnic groups, but also an increase in harassment and attacks on visible minorities. Many of these unsettling processes have been framed as crises, both real and perceived, and um, therefore, and thereby, um, they also offer an opportunity for us um, for critical reflection. Um, this has led, has led to the questioning of the relevance and appropriateness of categorizations and conceptualizations commonly applied um, to the study of migration. Who is considered a migrant um, and what are origin countries, transit countries uh, and destination countries? Who gets to decide which migration flows are to be stimulated, which to be restricted or even banned? Why do migrants stay and why do they leave? Estimates that predate these events um, already indicated that between 20 and 75 percent international of international migrants leave their destination country within the first five years after arrival. This means that a high proportion of migrants depart from their destination country in order to either temporarily return um, to their origin country or to onward migrate to another new destination country. There is an established literature on return migration, which has provided new insights into the motivations and experiences um, of returning migrants and their various forms of return. By contrast, onward migration still remains a relatively under-researched migration trajectory. 
Um, I would say this is largely because migration has generally been conceptualized as a bipolar process between an origin country A and a particular destination country B. The possible or actual moves to any further destinations have therefore often been disregarded. Um, so who do we actually kind of talk about when we're talking about onward migrants? Um, it is certainly difficult um, to uh, quantify um, onward migration because current immigration statistics and population register data um, provide an incomplete picture. Large scale surveys like the migrations between Africa and Europe or MAFE uh, longitudinal survey um, or even the um, NCCR migration mobility survey provide some more detailed insights about the prevalence and patterns um, of onward migration among specific migrant groups or in particular destination countries um, like Switzerland respectively. In addition, there are a growing number of qualitative studies which suggest that onward migration um, is a common migration trajectory amongst a wide range of different um, migrant categories. But when thinking about highly mobile individuals, um, it is nevertheless often cosmopolitan Western business people that dominate our imaginations. At least before the pandemic, these elites were jet setting around the world for business meetings um, and moved from country to country at will and without um, restrictions. In her research with working class Filipino and Indonesian migrants, Andrew Paul challenges the notion that cosmopolitan knowledge of the world as a preserve of the elites. She shows how um, more capital constrained, that's kind of her phrase, um, her term um, research, her, her more co capital constrained research participants um, undertake strategic stepwise migrations um, as domestic um, migrant workers um, to Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Italy, or even Cyprus, um, amongst other destinations. And these enable them to accumulate further skills, knowledge, and resources so they can reach Canada and the US. In Europe, several studies have been carried out um, on the onward migration of former refugee populations. Seeing that refugees usually cannot freely decide which country they flee to in search of protection, onward migration allows them to move to a place of their own choosing. Um, in fact, the UNHCR resettlement program um, could be cited as an example where onward migration is used as uh, one of several policy solutions for refugees who have spent long time periods in refugee camps and cannot return to their origin country. Um, furthermore, migrant families often establish multi-sited households and their geographical constellations can evolve over time across generations and often in response to individual needs and bordering processes. What these examples show us um, is that even though all these migrants lived in multiple destinations, um, their trajectories comprise different combinations of migrations and mobilities. This means that their lived experiences at uh, the individual level vary greatly, often depending on the migrants' legal status, um, their socioeconomic background, gender, race uh, and, and ethnicity. It might may, maybe even safe, safe to say that hardly um, any of them would label themselves as an onward migrant, um, as this kind of maybe remains um, quite a kind of academic categorization. So what value is there in conceptualizing this migration process as onward migration? Um, the overall aim um, of today's presentation is to examine how onward migration and transnational mobilities are interconnected. For this purpose, I draw insights from different uh, studies. I conducted um, one with Nigerian onward migrants in Europe and another with students at international branch campuses in Dubai, as well as other um, published research on onward migration. Um, I will start off by introducing the term multi-sided transnationalism with the specific aim of broadening the analysis um, of migrant transnationalism beyond its common bipolar framing, which is restricted to one origin country, well, the origin country and one um, particular destination country. 
Um, given that uh, onward migration is an unfolding and open-ended migration trajectory, it calls for a multi-sided um, or even a multi-directional conceptualization of transnational mobilities, ties and practices. Then I examine how uh, transnational mobilities can shape onward migration intentions and experiences. For instance, um, short visits to new destinations can enable individuals to better prepare for onward migration. Finally, I explore how different types of onward migration may result in varying forms and directions um, of transnational mobilities. Onward migrants, for example, may not only stay in touch with their friends and relatives in their origin country, but mm, they also maintain transnational ties with uh, individuals in previous countries of residence or other destinations. Um, thereby, I draw attention to the role of onward migration in shaping um, global mobility patterns. Um, yeah, now on to kind of yeah, defining onward migration. Onward migration is a trajectory that involves extended stays in two or more destination countries, acknowledging that any migrant can be a potential onward migrant or return migrant, allows for a more processual understanding of migration and the dynamic application of migrant categories. Um, after living in one destination country, migrants may decide to move on to one or several new destinations. Countries and places this can change from destinations into points of departure. Despite growing scholarly interest over recent years in trajectories that span multiple countries, I would like to stress that complex multinational migrations are nothing new. They have always formed part of global mobility patterns and early theorizations of migration um, by Ravenstein and also by Mabogunje um, already described migration processes that occurred in stages along particular pathways from smaller villages via towns to bigger cities. The image that you see on uh, this slide is taken um, is a photo taken of East African Asians arriving at Heathrow Airport. In her seminal book on international onward migration, Parminda Bachu um, documents the twice migration of East African Sikhs to the UK. They were part of a wider group of South, South Asians in East Africa, comprising um, wealthy Gujarati entrepreneurs who had lived in East Africa for centuries, and Punjabi indentured workers um, who built the Kenya-Uganda rail lines. When the newly independent nation states introduced Africanization um, policies um, from 1968 onwards, these groups were an obvious target. Um, but they found that as British subjects, they were unable to enter Britain freely. The uh, 1962 um, Commonwealth Immigration Act subjected Commonwealth citizens um, to immigration controls for the first time. And um, yeah, the British government was quite alarmed um, by the sudden influx of thousands of East African um, Asian families. Um, so the government tightened controls in 1968 and they required um, any um, newly arriving um, immigrants to show close connection to the UK. Um, even if they were kind of um, held British citizenship. Um, of course, this is um, yeah, the um, issue with kind of um, a lot of the post-colonial migration um, where empire um, was yeah, conceived and comprised many people that then also um, sought to come to the metropole, um, um, kind of to the centre, um, the UK. The um, research field of onward migration remains difficult to circumscribe due to the countless labels used for this migration trajectory. Two other examples of open-ended conceptions of migration are the book on serial migration by Susan Osman and the two special issues on multinational migration I mentioned earlier, um, guest edited by Andrew Paul and Bernd Ayo. Um, I now turn to transnationalism to help me explain um, how I will conceptualize transnational mobility within the migration mobility nexus. Um, transnationalism is concerned with um, the cross-border connections and practices of individuals and communities, um, as well as institutions that transcend the boundaries of the nation state. Nina Glickschiller and her colleagues argued that after um, leaving their origin country, trans migrants can remain involved um, uh, and become 
yeah, fir firmly um, rooted in their new country, but they simultaneously also maintain multiple linkages to their homeland. Through transnationalism, um, scholars also try to challenge the sedentary bias um, and the methodolog methodological um, nationalism they believed dominated um, migration studies thus far. Um, yeah, and the yeah, uh, wider social sciences. Um, in their seminal book, Nations Unbound, Linda Bash and her colleagues state that trans migrants take actions, um, make decisions and develop su subjectivities and identities embedded in networks of relationship that connect them to two or more nation states. Um, yeah, this is just one quote um, that shows that um, transnationalism wasn't necessarily only um, theoretic theoretically at least conceived as um, yeah, solely tiles and ties and connections between the origin and destination country. Um, yet empirical research on transnationalism has tended to focus on the transnational moves, connections and identifications limited to one origin country and a particular destination country. This has also been criticized as a methodological binationalism. Therefore, I think we should not assume that transnational ties and mobilities of all migrants are by default solely directed at their origin country and that they then wax and wane or um, fade away. But I am equally cautious about um, going to the other extreme of looking for transnationalism everywhere. Instead, I propose an explicitly multi-sided conceptualization of transnationalism as it might help facilitate a more comprehensive understanding, but also a particular emic perspective on transnational mobilities and ties. Multi-sided transnationalism contributes to two different schools of thought within transnationalism. Um, for scholars who um, ascribed to the social field interpretation of transnationalism um, and that uh, see kind of the uh, community, um, transnational community perspective as dominant. Um, Multi-sided transnational couldn't be interpreted as an expansion of the transnational field to include multiple and possibly even shifting centers of gravity. While for those um, scholars who favor a practice um, oriented interpretation of transnationalism, um, which focuses on the ties and uh, transnational ties and actions, um, multi sided transnational couldn't, can be understood um, as um, several nodes of contact in different destinations that mirror the spatial configuration of networks, either on the ind individual or community level. Uh, due to limitations of time and also in order to engage um, um, with the um, migration mobility um, nexus in particular, today I will mainly focus on transnational mobilities um, and um, not on transnational um, ties or transnational belonging. Um, the Migration Mobility Nexus brings together two strands of literature um, that have referred uh, to human movement either as migration or as mobility. Um, uh, and I will discuss these uh, now in particular reference to uh, the European Union, um, where these um, two terms refer to two interlinked but distinct policy regimes. The migration um, regime deals with the movement of people crossing the external borders of the EU and is seen as a matter of freedom, security and justice. Um, by contrast, the internal mobility um, or freedom of movement is one of the four fundamental freedoms of the European Union. The preference for using mobility to refer to inter-European migration, however, throws up several issues. Um, uh, I would briefly problematize migration of mobility as categories of practice um, with particular reference to onward migration and um, the 2011 census data, <laughs> um, which is fairly outdated at this point, but we're currently yeah, awaiting um, the next round. Um, First, uh, the use of the term mobility reinforces the policy objective of distinguishing between the desirable free movement of EU citizens and the undesirable migration of third country nationals. This is, supposed, this is a supposed clear cut distinction between EU citizens and third country nationals. However, it is being blurred in several ways. 
Um, for instance, um, there are uh, 15, approximately 15, in, in 2011, there are 15.8 million third country nationals who had um, acquired EU citizenship um, and they could also potentially make use of their freedom of movement. Um, furthermore, um, there's a um, big group of um, second generation migrants that um, um, live in Europe and also are um, many of them EU citizens. Um, in total, um, there are 41.7 million of them, um, or there were in 2011, who had either a migration background um, or migration experience themselves. Um, and then um, kind of another um, yeah, category of migrant that enjoys uh, freedom of movement, but um, are not kind of native Europeans, are the um, holders of EU long-term residence papers. Um, and this gives third country nationals um, rights that are similar to free movement, um, and they can seek employment in another member state, but it, um, their mobility is currently um, yeah, not captured in the statistics whatsoever. Um, although, um, yeah, and although they have the right to seek employment, um, they need to overcome substantial hurdles um, to be issued with a work permit. Um, so we can see that, yeah, they're within EU citizenship, um, um, depending on, um, yeah, uh, various factors, there's quite a distinction and hierarchization of um, rights or how they can be used and operationalized. The second point that I would like to make is that mobility implies that people will not settle permanently and continue to be mobile by either running, returning um, home or moving elsewhere. The renewed focus on seasonal and temporary migration programs undoubtedly is part of a wider trend in policy making. Uh, and several international organizations have promoted mobility in their recent reports. It is therefore appropriate to question the underlying um, logics of these new policy imperatives and if they include due consideration for migrant rights. Um, in actual fact, there is um, large groups of migrants who um, kind of EU citizens uh, who move to another country and then stay there for extended uh, amounts of time. And um, you know, it is also necessary not only um, to portray onward migrants or mobile citizens as constantly on the move, nor should we assume that they want to be. The moves um, of onward migrants um, have been compared to those of footloose uh, cosmopolitans or nomads, but that is not to say that they have no claims to place or rights. Um, thus, it is important to study the mobility of onward migrants alongside their emplacements. Finally, there is an assumption that the short distance internal mobility across member states is easier and more fluid than the long distance migration to and from Europe. Uh, in fact, mobility within the frontier of free Schengen land is often likened to internal migration. But paradoxically, the overall inter-European mobility intensities remain much lower than internal migration intensities in other parts of the world. Intra-European uh, migrants usually account for approximately 3% of the resident population, whereas, for instance, in India, um, internal migrants make up 30% of the country's population. Um, so, um, I will now um, kind of, yeah, say something briefly about uh, pre-migration uh, mobilities um, that also, yeah, several scholars have tried to shed light on. Um, uh, in terms of the migration processes that involve in between mobilities, um, which can bring migrants closer to reaching a particular destination. Um, these are, uh, for example, transit migration, indirect migration, or triangular migration. Um, Heinde Hein Haas and Mike Collier um, introduced the concept of frag fragmented migration to better describe the perilous journeys that African migrants undertake over land and sea. Um, because transit migration um, is a very politicized category um, uh, and is portrayed as a threat to European societies, many um, of the external dimensions of EU policy are also aimed at stopping this migration. Um, yes, and this is, was also the topic of a talk that Mike gave to you uh, recently, so I won't uh, go into too much detail. Um, 
but um, at the same time, yeah, the African Union is also trying to promote mobility within the region of its members. Um, and therefore, um, it is wrong to assume that all African migrants leave their origin countries with a plan to enter Europe. Their trajectories take twists and turns and they respond to changing situations. In terms of methodology, yours, uh, Sharpendong, um, has argued in favor of using a trajectory approach to study the pre-migration mobilities of West African migrants. He stayed in touch with his informants via mobile, email, uh, etc. while they migrated within Africa or towards Europe and he continued to follow their trajectories um, once they reached the European uh, territory. Um, after reaching a destination, migrants may have enhanced mobility rights and new resources that allow them to engage in post-migration mobilities. Um, Polish migrants, um, uh, for instance, are said to be settled in mobility um, in order to improve their lives at home and not have to um, emigrate permanently. They remain, remain mobile and continuously seek out new destinations. Um, for the Polish migrants, this type of out ongoing mobility became possible following Poland's, Poland's um, accession to the European Union, um, which allowed them to yeah, work in any member state. Um, and yeah, this is similar also to the experience of the uh, migrants that your colleague Joel Moret um, carried out, uh, studied um, together with them. Um, they were the um, yeah, um, EU migrants of Somali origin, and she proposed the term mobility capital to show how um, migrants that faced um, yeah, discrimination within the uh, Swiss context were able to um, use the skills and resources that they had um, and activate them um, through um, transnational mobility. Um, migrants also, um, yeah, actively contest categorizations um, in their mobility strategies. In my research with Nigerian migrants, I encountered um, several Nigerians who found themselves in a semi-legal state as many informants had who held short-term residence permits in Spain or Italy were traveling to Austria, Germany or the Netherlands and Norway um, for periods under a year. Um, and according um, to the EU acquis, they were allowed to stay as tourists in other Schengen countries for a period of up to three months. Um, but um, yeah, they tended to um, overstay uh, and avoid um, yeah, any electronic traces of their um, entry dates by also um, relying on um, ride share um, or other um, transport that um, yeah wasn't plane travel. Um, as Kubal um, points out, it is difficult for authorities to know exactly when these three months um, then have elapsed if there are no electronic traces. And um, yeah, and this is one particular migration strategy, but then it means also a mobility strategy that allowed them also to cope with the um, lack of resources they faced in, in Spain due to, um, as a result of the economic crisis um, in 2008. Um, so it wasn't necessarily um, yeah, an activation of resources, um, but um, uh, yeah, an acquisition of new um, financial resources that weren't, um, locally available them, to them in Spain at that time. So um, mobility facilitated that. Um, another example um, of, um, yeah, post-migration mobilities could also be um, what the, um, what is termed secondary movements of asylum seekers um, that are, um, that they could be described as irregularized mobilities that take place following a migration to a first safe country. So this would be like a policy kind of conception um, of um, post-migration mobilities. So now we move on to um, the mobilities and um, how they not only um, happen from one um, particular destination country um, in different um, forms, but how they then uh, in their processual, processual nature also sometimes um, allow for uh, onward migration. Um, 
in a joint paper that I wrote um, together with Ilse van Limt and Melissa Kelly, um, we analyzed the various motivations um, of naturalized uh, third country nationals within the European Union. And we were drawing uh, on our respective research with different groups of onward migrants. Um, these were the um, Somali migrants that uh, Issa Falim studied and also the um, Iranian migrants that previously lived in Sweden, uh, whom uh, Melissa Kelly conducted research with. And then, yeah, the Nigerian migrants um, that I uh, carried out research with. And this was uh, then for Germany, um, where they were moving between the UK and Germany. And um, we found that um, based on um, the data that we um, were analyzing, um, based on our case studies, um, there were uh, several um, factors um, that influenced the um, the motivations that uh, motivated kind of the mobilities um, the, um, and also the eventual onward migration away from their first country um, of settlement. And um, these included um, desires to be closer to co-ethnic and diaspora communities and to offer children better educational opportunities or to escape discrimination and racism, amongst other things. Um, yeah, it is important to note here that all of the um, migrant um, groups that we conducted um, research with were um, people of color and in the case of um, uh, the Somalis they were also um, Muslim um, so therefore the discrimination and racism they faced um, were considerable um, and possibly heightened compared to um, other migrant groups um, so um, then maybe um, this article also suggests that uh, for these three groups the reactive transnationalism um, could most likely describe the motivation for these um, mobilities which at times involved, um, yeah, exploratory transnationalism to um, seek out new destinations, to make um, visits and see um, what opportunities um, were available um, and um, then also prepare a more permanent move. Um, in my research in, in Manchester, I um, came across also people um, from different um, institutions who were aware that uh, these types of movement were happening because they received requests from um, individuals who um, came to um, schools and to, um, or who called schools and um, who went to the, um, yeah, different um, places to, to make preparatory inquiries. Um, but the outcomes um, of these mobilities are often multidimensional. Um, given that not all individuals possess all the requisite uh, resources that facilitate a smooth mobility and settlement, um, therefore, prospective um, onward migrants, well, those who have a plan to maybe relocate, um, generally try to prepare their relocation in order to avoid situations where living standards are negatively effective. But um, some onward migrants also encounter problems when the move to another place or country, um, uh, yeah, when they encounter problems or when they have to go to extended times of um, readjustment. Um, in some instances, onward migration can be as difficult as the initial migration and settlement, especially where migrants lack agency um, or face unexpected situation, um, or they cannot counter the support from others. Um, onward migrants, um, yeah, keep in touch with friends and relatives um, in a variety of places, um, and this um, is yeah one key point that I um, would like to stress is that um, through the onward migration, the um, networks and um, yeah transnational ties that um, onwards onward migrants have are expanded um, and also reconfigured. Um, so the visits that they then um, undertake after an onward migration um, are not necessarily all um, directed. Um, 
at um, yeah, the country of origin, but um, many um, of the people I spoke to, they also, um, well, in the, many of the Nigerians I spoke to, they also were visiting um, their previous countries um, of settlement and um, they were visiting um, even some left behind family members um, in Germany if they had a um, multi-local family. Um, this has obviously also implications um, for their feelings of belonging and um, over the course of generations, as was the case with the uh, first example that I um, cited um, from the East African Asians, is that then also the um, yeah, the hearth, the cultural hearth of the um, uh, migrant community can shift from um, the origin country to the uh, to a previous country of residence, so um, also the um, yeah the Nigerians I spoke to some of them um, once all of their uh, family were um, based in London came to see uh, London as their um, main place of residence and home, but they still visited uh, Nigeria regularly um, and uh, other places. Um, for business um, and also for family trips. Um, the degree of transnational home and home orientation um, is also different between the first and second generation. This is because the second generation often feel a greater belonging to their country of birth or the current country of residence, but they identify less with the parents' ancestral homeland. So in the case of uh, my research with um, yeah, the international and also domestic students in um, Dubai, um, this was actually um, quite an issue because they, of course, um, at least the, the second generation um, students who were studying locally at international branch campuses uh, regarded Dubai as their home, um, but um, their rights of stay um, dependent were dependent on their student status or on finding a job immediately uh, upon graduation and therefore their rights, um, at least, yeah, this was gendered, of course, um, the um, rights of male um, graduates um, who were um, born and raised in Dubai were no different uh, from those uh, who uh, came to the country as international students. Um, but then, yeah, they were faced um, at times with um, very difficult um, uh, decisions um, when their um, yeah, residence uh, permit expired or they lost a job because they were um, yeah, required to return to uh, India, even though they didn't have maybe strong connections um, to that um, place. Um, apart from occasional visits to family. Um, so to conclude, um, onward migra migration um, complexifies our understanding of migration and uh, furthermore onward migration um, needs to be seen not just as a discrete um, migration event which must be added uh, to a wide um, variety of space time manifestations of mobility. Um, I uh, suggest that it needs to be embedded into um, yeah, broader conceptualizations and mappings of migration um, as a global phenomenon that is undergoing constant change. And um, secondly, um, thinking of um, this um, and other kinds of move um, as part of the migration career or migration project um, is encased and also within individual family and intergenerational um, life course in, in, in that life course. Um, we also need to critically um, yeah, appraise the methods and theoretical frameworks um, we use. Um, yeah time and time again, but also uh, in particular when we're faced with um, yeah, migra my migratory trajectory that do not uh, seem to neatly fit um, our often um, previous kind of conceptions of um, the way uh, migration um, used to be framed between an origin country and a destination country. So um, this is um, something that needs to yeah, be reevaluated, and um, the implications uh, for this um, for the migration mobility nexus is to then um, also 
yeah, more clearly um, evaluate these migration and mobility connections and see how they um, produce um, different um, migration trajectories um, overall and how um, this then um, contributes to the global map of um, international geographies um, of migration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jill, for this fascinating talk. Uh, I will now invite Laure to discuss your presentation. Thank you. For about 10 minutes. Thank yes. You. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Jill, this was a really fascinating talk. Uh, and I think it's also a very good contribution to our ongoing reflections at the NCC on the move. Uh, on the multiple relationships that exist between migration and mobility, and also on the way that we conceptualize uh, these two terms. So I think that, is it okay? Ah, uh, yeah, I think you need to, to mute maybe, Jill, because we can yes. Yes. hear you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I think that our first important contribution of your paper is that it moves beyond a view of migration and transnationalism that would be limited to a unique relationship between a migrant's country of origin and country of destination, as you just said. So you, you rightly show the diversity of migrants' mobilities, and you also encourage us to look at migration as a complex and ongoing process that can be composed of various moves over the life, lifetime and even across generations, and that can involve connections not just between two places, but between a diversity of places. And this way of looking at human trajectories blurs the traditional uh, distinction between migration and mobility, and it raises interesting questions such as, is there something distinctive to migration compared to other forms of movement? And if yes, what is it? Uh, or when does a person start being a migrant? And when do they stop being a migrant? A migrant? And in the end, this big question, are we all not migrants? Um, I think that actually you, your approach connects very well with the research that uh, I am currently conducting at the University of Neuchâtel, together with my colleagues, uh, Christina Mitmasser, Ivan Riagno, uh, Lorena Izaguirre, and Etienne Piguet on transnational migrant entrepreneurship. In our project, uh, we are interested in the kind of connections and mobilities uh, that migrants use in order to develop cross-border business projects. Uh, and we ask to what extent and under which conditions they can use the mobility as an asset for their business. Uh, like you, we see that the literature on transnational migrant entrepreneurship has been growing a lot over uh, the past two decades with the realization that migrant entrepreneurs are not limited to one place only and that they can use transnationalism as a resource uh, to fight exclusion and discrimination in their place of residence uh, and also to improve their livelihood and to expand their options across borders. However, we also see that in a vast majority of cases, uh, research focuses on how migrants mobilize resources in their country of origin and use them in the country of residence, or it looks at how returnees use resources from their former country of residence. And in our project, we are critical of this limited focus because we think that it reproduces a representation of migrants as limited to and defined by their ethnic origin. We think that uh, failing to look beyond uh, the binary between country of origin and country of destination does not fully acknowledge the agency of migrant entrepreneurs uh, and their ability to create new connections beyond uh, their primary network. So during our ethnographic fieldwork with transnational migrant entrepreneurs in Switzerland, Spain and Colombia, we observed that many people start their business uh, using contacts, knowledge and experience that they have accumulated throughout the life course uh, and previous mobilities. However, in many cases, they also managed to expand beyond this first base to access new opportunities in new places. We asked our interviewees to draw maps of their previous mobilities and also of all the places with which they are in contact for their business. And we were really astounded to see the richness and diversity of their connections. Of course, onward migration is one strategy that they use, 
but many of them also rely on other forms of short term and circulatory movements. And sometimes they do not even need to move or want to move because they can connect with others using digital technologies or they have business partners, employees or family members uh, that can move for them. Now, uh, at the same time, we are also aware that uh, there exist important inequalities in the way people can move and mobilize resources across border. And so we are also very interested in our project to understand how such inequalities are shaped by power relations and how they affect certain categories of people more than others. So this brings me to a second important contribution of your paper, I think, which is to show uh, that onward migration is something that can apply to all categories of migrants uh, and not only to the highly skilled or to people with high capital, as it is sometimes suggested in the literature. As you showed with the internationalization of firms at a global scale, but also the increasing focus of nation states on attracting highly skilled migrants and the development of a regime of free movement within the EU, a normative in mobility and migration has been grown with the idea that mobility is the privilege of a global elite and something positive to be aimed for, while migration remains a more problematic and less desirable form of movement. Yet, um, your research and, and other uh, research in social science shows that frequent mobility is also a practice and a strategy enacted by less privileged group of people to navigate the structural obstacles that they face and uh, to find ways to improve their livelihood. You mentioned the, the, the work of Joël Moret on uh, the unwarped migration patterns of Somali migrants in the EU. And I think that um, something very interesting in, the, in her work is also that uh, she shows how obtaining a stable status in an EU country was a crucial step for many of her interviewees to enable them to move further. So thereby she highlights the dialectical relationship between mobility and immobility, and also how uh, this changes through time and the importance of having a certain degree of embeddedness into the regulatory regime of a specific place in order to gain more control over one's own mobility. So actually in our project on transnational entrepreneurship, we have been inspired by, by this work because uh, it clearly shows that uh, to be able to decide how to move, when to move, where to move, and with what consequences is a form of power. And in that sense, uh, we should clearly not see mobility as being only the privilege of an elite, but at the same time, we should also be aware that the ability to control one's mobility is unequally shared. Um, here, I think it is also interesting to see migration and mobility not only as the outcome uh, of individual decisions, but as something that is embedded in specific regimes and infrastructures that shape the options and aspirations of individuals. And in your presentation, I found really interesting when you mentioned how unwanted migration may also be a strategy used by governments and other organizations in order to control or to manage uh, the mobility of people. Um, in my previous research on mobile highly skilled professionals in Switzerland, I found it very interesting to observe how many of my interviewees viewed repeated relocations as something necessary for them in order to pursue a career in their field, but not necessarily something that uh, they desired. And, um, well, many of them were actually holding privileged positions in terms of capital and social status, uh, but at the same time, they also experienced a form of precariousness and ambiguity coming from the fact that they had actually very little control over their mobility and that each new move put them in a situation where they had to rebuild a sense of security. On top of that, um, for, for many, actually the, mainly the, the non-EU uh, citizens, uh, their legal status was uh, directly connected to the job or to the job of their partner, meaning that if they lost either their job or their partner, they would also be forced to leave the country. So, as you should, uh, onward migration is a diverse and complex phenomenon that can take many shapes and that can be experienced in many different ways. And I think that to analyze it, uh, it is really important to connect it to the issue of power and starting from the power that one has to control their own mobility and immobility. Of course, this power is connected to many factors and is shaped by the intersection of many categories of difference, uh, 
you mentioned class, gender, nationality, race. I think age is also a very important uh, one, and uh, the, the, this question of the, of the life course. And of course, it is also uh, shaped by specific infrastructures and regulatory regimes that apply at multiple scales, ranging from global inequalities to the characteristics of certain uh, localities and professional sectors. So, in conclusion, I would like to suggest the argument that the perception that people have of their onward migration as something positive or negative is very directly connected to the issue of power and in particular to the sense of control that these people have over their ability to move or not to move. So, yeah, this is what I wanted to bring to this topic. Chris, uh, Jill, to know what uh, you think about my, about this idea that I present now, and I'm very, well, uh, very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Laure. Uh, I think, uh, Jill, can you, do you want, I suggest you, you react right now to the comments and um, by Laure, and afterwards we will open the floor. Is it okay for you? You can, you have to unmute your microphone. The navigation bar has disappeared again. Um, so I, um, yeah, to thank you, Laura, um, for um, your discussion. I think, um, yeah, the um, research that you are conducting at the NCCR so is really interesting. Um, um, and what you described about, um, yeah, the entrepreneurs um, who, um, yeah, we're engaging in a wide range of business activities, but uh, you felt that um, thus far the um, yeah literature on uh, transnational entrepreneurship really um, um, presents a quite limited picture of um, ethnic entrepreneurship um, that draws mainly um, on the resources from the home country, and um, yeah, I really hope that you um, manage to present a, a wider and more diverse um, picture of all the activities that the um, um, that your research participants um, were involved in um, and also how you described then how um, they were able to progressively expand um, I think their networks that is um, a really um, yeah worthwhile while point uh, mentioning because I think um, in the um, research on migration, um, what we um, have is a lot of the um, um, resources um, that are considered at the kind of for leaving an origin country. Um, but then um, there's clearly um, a need to also look at the resources and the um, and the power structures and the inequalities that are at play that structure then any further mobilities beyond that and the um, resources that are required um, to to continually engage in um, yeah um, a new environment or possibly even further destinations um, and um, yeah, the other point you mentioned about highly skilled um, migrants who were continuously mobile, but uh, perceived it more of a burden. Um, this is kind of something um, that maybe um, yeah sets in for for some um, um, hypermobile uh, individuals who feel that they're following certain pathways and have to maybe do it in order to earn a livelihood, but they would much rather maybe at also at different life stages um, have, um, yeah, another um, lifestyle um, if it requires really a lot of um, mobility from their side. So um, I think that was also um, echoed and maybe um research that um 
Andrew Paul conducted where kind of the migrants were continuously mobile and they wanted to reach um, a certain destination, but they had to invest um, a lot of time and also um, do quite low um, status and low paid jobs for such a long time that they um, found that they didn't, they maybe reached the destination, but they did get stuck in certain professions. Um, so that's kind of the, maybe the other coin of um, that um yeah story that you're telling here um that um sometimes even a um a certain professional pathway then determines our mobility and it's kind of difficult to then sidestep um it affords us certain opportunities but um then yeah over time we maybe also um want to have not just a change of um location but maybe also a change um of 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 profession that um enables another lifestyle um yes and i'd be also interested kind of to hear from 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 others about kind of further research that you are um doing at nccr i think kind of from what i was reading also about the migration um, mobility survey i was really interested to see um the high incidence of um onward migrants um, there. So um, my question to you is also um, if you're planning to do more research on that and if that also concerns the particular migrant group um, that you're working with that they um, that you would maybe yeah mainly see them as onward migrants or are they kind of um, yeah just mobile highly skilled individuals. Sorry, I don't know if you react to that, but actually that's also maybe one question uh, arising from this talk about um, and in general about the migration mobility nexus, I guess, but this distinction between migration and mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in our project, we tend to speak a lot about mobility and less about migration, but then is on one migration a good alternative? Why not speak simply of mobility? It's yeah, always a bit of a debate among us. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for, for your reactions also to uh, Laure's uh, comments. Uh, I don't want to go much into details because that's not my expertise, but uh, a lot of research here in the at the NCCR also exploits this data uh, with the mm -hmm. Migration Mobility Survey and uh, is looking at how migrants, how how they move also inside uh, Switzerland and what are their re residential choices. Uh, uh, I think there are at least two projects who are precisely looking at uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, mechanisms. So, um, but we can talk about that maybe more tomorrow if you, yeah. if you want, because um, I'm not myself conducting this research. The questions or comments regarding your um, your talk, uh, your presentation. So if somebody wants to jump in, just don't be shy. Ask your question to Jill. I do not see any hands uh, raising. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I will jump in <laughs> with with one yeah. questions with, with one one question actually. Uh, is um, thank you very much for for your talk by the way, uh, which was very interesting and I think 
uh, you made an important effort to engage with our reflection on the migration mobility nexus. And so thank you very much for that. And I think you already uh, touched upon uh, different interplays between migration and mobility. And mm. also you didn't touch on, upon only about the, um, the um, enablement inter interplay, but also about the hierarchy and also how uh, migration is usually treated more negatively than um, mobility, also in discourse, in, in political discourse. And I think this is an important aspect of this interplay. But um, I just wanted to, uh, I just had one question about your choice to focus here on uh, maybe uh, more on your research about Ni Nigerian onward migration um, in Europe and not so much about uh, the, um, the international students in campus, campus uh, branches in uh, Dubai that you also yeah. had. And uh, just can you, can you say maybe some words about that, about, the, about this kind of study and how do you see it uh, embedded in this reflection about uh, migration mobility nexus? Yes, thank you. Um, I um, yeah, have just recently completed this research. Um, so the um, the analysis and the kind of writing up uh, from this project is still ongoing. So, of course, then um, some of the reflections on my previous research for uh, my PhD are um, a lot more um, yeah, developed. And I think um, having these opportunities also to engage with other um, yeah, frameworks that you are working on uh, will certainly help me also to 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 kind of critically also look at my data again um for the international students in dubai um the reason i mean i was um previously working on international student mobility um with a team um in sussex and um uh, the university of dundee as a research assistant and i in a sense for my postdoc came back to this topic but um i did see the opportunity to also um, work on onward migration simply um because of the um yeah particular um immigration uh, infrastructure within the united arab emirates um which uh, to some extent uh appears to be the polar opposite um um in that um unlike many other destination countries um permanent residence and um the attaining of citizenship is um virtually not completely but virtually um impossible so by definition any migration that um, people undertake to dubai is um yeah defined by um, permanent transience um, or, um, yeah, just um, instability, even though people learn to um, really, yeah, settle in, in, in that mode and do perceive um, to be um, firmly then also rooted over generations in Dubai. But um, what I was trying to then explain is that um, the status of um, even families who've been living um, in the country for generations, um, at least for the uh, male graduates, is no different to um, recently arrived international students. And they um, have to find um, uh, an entry into the labor market in order to then um, have um, a, a resident status. Um, this was recently changed actually in 2018 that graduates who have a high degree uh, classification can get um, a five year um, or even a 10 year visa. Um, and that, um, yeah, I think doctors and engineers are also able to get now long, longer term residence permits. But um, the issue simply is that um, without, yeah, connections um it's quite difficult to survive in dubai on an entry level pay so this kind of then um generates additional mobilities some of them are um 
pathways that a lot of them choose to go to other destinations for postgraduate study. So um, um, because it's uh, comparatively cheaper to study locally um, for the um, Asian uh, diaspora, um, they then go for um, the shorter master's course, maybe somewhere else, and that's what many people do, and then they come back and they might go somewhere else um, to work later. Um, but Dubai very much is like, um, yeah, a base maybe of those mobilities um, and the configurations and the patterns of um, mobilities of those who came as international students to um, Dubai are quite different, and I find that kind of comparison really interesting um, to see how um, people yeah, are mobile or are forced to be mobile in a context that doesn't really offer you um, settlement, whereas, um, yeah, in the European Union, the um, mobility sometimes is occurring against the expectation of integration and, and permanent residence. You're either expected as a, as a migrant to stay or to go back to your origin country. Um, so the possibility that you move elsewhere is not really foreseen um, in uh, the policy agenda, at least not if you're, um, um, yeah, uh, a migrant who has attained EU citizenship up until recently, I guess, but now um, there's a growing awareness around that. Thank you so much for your answer. Other persons want to ask a question or make a comment to Jill? We have some time if you want. So check on the YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no. It does not seem to be the case. Okay. So, um, otherwise, so I would like to thank you very much, uh, Jill, for mm -hmm. this fascinating talk. And uh, thank you very much for having made this effort to engage uh, in this um, migration mobility nexus uh, reflection. I think, yeah, you made a, a great contribution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want also to thank uh, Laure for her comments and for her interesting discussion to your presentation. And uh, Jill, I will see you tomorrow morning for the yes. workshop. And also I seize this opportunity to remind you that we will continue our reflections with other keynote speakers for this mm -hmm. uh, public lecture series on the Migration Mobility Nexus. And the next uh, um, talk, the next lecture is, um, it will be done by uh, Angela Paparusso, who works at the Institute for Research on Population and Social Policies. And her talk will be entitled, Return Migration Intentions and Self-Reported Life Satisfaction. What do immigrants tell us? And it will be part of the continuum interplay between migration and mobility. So nice program and I'll, I hope I see many of you there and I wish you a good evening to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. Great. Yeah, thank you also for the comments. <laughs> I've been reading the comments here. So, um, yeah, I'll see uh, some of you tomorrow. I look forward to uh, having kind of further discussions. Thank you ever so much for the invitation.